Okay, once again, my name is Marty Hurstein. I'm the director here at Connecticut School of Broadcasting. I know it's a tight fit, but I thank you all for coming tonight. Connecticut School of Broadcasting, before you either heard about us on the radio or saw our ad on television or, you know, searched us out on the internet, how many people had heard of Connecticut School of Broadcasting? All right, how many people thought Connecticut School of Broadcasting, it probably is in Connecticut? Well, it makes sense. You don't have to be shy. If you've done your research, you know that Connecticut School of Broadcasting was started in 1964. There was a radio DJ in the Connecticut market, and his name was Dick Robinson. And he was a real player in the industry. I mean, he interviewed the Beatles and the Who and Sonny and Cher and all the British invasion bands. But he had a vision about this industry, which we still apply to our teaching methodology today, that this is a hands-on, learn-by-doing program. In other words, if you come to Connecticut School of Broadcasting, you're going to learn every aspect of radio, both in front of the microphone and behind the scenes on the production side, voiceovers. On the television side, you're going to learn to be a field reporter, a field producer, a floor manager, everything on the technical side, on the TV side. Hands-on, learn by doing. In other words, the more skills that you have, the better chance you have of succeeding in this industry. You come out with the skills to put together a demo tape. Can anybody tell me what a demo tape is? Sir? It's a tape to show people your skills pretty much. Right, it's a demonstration of your skills, right? Let's say I come out of a program like this and I want to be on a radio station and I know there's a job available at a classic rock station and I happen to put together a demo for an oldies format. Am I going to send that, that oldies format to the classic rock station? No, you're shaking your head. What's going to happen? It's two different formats, genres. You know where it ends up? In the garbage can. And chances are, even if you sent the right format six months later, they're still laughing at the schlock that you sent them. <laughs> Believe me, it works that way. Professionalism, having the skills to know where you're marketing yourself as a performer or behind the scenes or as a digital editor. Now, what Dick did, in 1964, he bought some old ratty radio equipment and he started the first Connecticut School of Broadcasting in Farmington, Connecticut. And now, over 45 years later, we have 11 campuses up and down the East Coast. Our corporate offices are in Farmington, Connecticut. We have another school in Stratford, Connecticut. We have a school that services the Boston market, a school in Westbury, Long Island. We're here now 17 years in Hasbrook Heights. We have another school in the Philadelphia market, another school in the Atlanta market, a school in the Charlotte market, and three schools in Florida. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the reason that I go through that whole laundry list is that as a graduate of this school or any of the campuses, you have lifetime use of the school's facilities. And believe me, if you're going to work in this industry, you're going to be in these studios all the time, right? Now, classes. We have three semesters a year. Our next semester starts November 9th. We have a day class that starts on the 9th. It's Monday through Thursday from 10 o'clock in the morning till 1.30 in the afternoon. It's an intense eight-week class with your potential graduation date right now, January 6th. Then we do one evening class a semester. And I think on the paperwork, I gave you an option of Monday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday. I only do one night class a semester, and I'll tell you exactly why. This semester, we're going to do a Tuesday and Thursday class. It's 16 weeks from 6.30 at night till 10 o'clock at night, an intense, once again, 16 weeks with your potential graduation day right now. I believe it is February 26th. Now, if anybody thinks that they're going to come here four days a week or two nights a week and you're going to work in this industry, you're sadly mistaken. You see all these studios and you all get a chance to see all our studios later. Uh, we require every one of our students put in a minimum of four hours extra studio time in a week because we run this school like this industry is run, which means it's deadline upon deadline, project upon project, 
at the end of a program like this, you are producing a full-blown radio show, you're producing a talk radio show, you're producing a sports radio show, you're producing tons of radio commercials and imaging pieces. On the television side, you're producing your own TV commercial. You're producing uh, a movie review show. You're producing your own uh, news packages. On the digital editing side, you're learning two different digital editing softwares. You don't do those things by coming a couple of nights a week or four days a week to class. Now look, it's fun, it's exciting. Every time you learn something, you need to get right back into the studios and perfect it. It's not the type of program where you're going to sit in a classroom and learn the history of radio and television. Once again, our job is to make you marketable in this industry, and that's why it's hands-on, learn by doing. I'll give you an idea of someone that might come here. Maybe someone had a couple of years of college, and they're sitting in class thinking, I am so bored, I'm not passionate about anything. Maybe there's guys that, or women, that listen to ESPN all day at work, or WFAN all day at work, and they think, you know what? I can, I'd love to cover sports for a living. Maybe someone that worked in radio 15, 20 years ago, and knows that the industry has changed. Or someone that's just digging ditches and miserable in their life. The great thing about a school like this and this industry is if you come out of here and you put together a great demo, someone is going to hire you in this industry. And that's our job, to help you get to that point. Let me tell you what, it, what happens with demos. A program director is someone that runs a radio station or a TV station. And if they're worth their weight, and believe me, in this market, the number one market in the world, they're worth their weight. Every week they sit down with their staff and they listen to new uh, radio demos. They listen to new television reporter demos. And if you're good, believe me, nobody cares what you did for a living. They want to get you in there because they don't want the competition to get you. All right? So let me tell you what's going on around here. Um, this is what's called Studio A. And all the lights should be on, and I apologize. And I'll turn them on. Studio A, all our studios are state-of-the-art equipment. And it's very important that you realize that. Because a lot of our graduates uh, or students that are taking internships, and I'll go into internships later, uh, they start at some of these small stations. And they call me and they say, wow, Marty, this equipment here is incredibly archaic. That's okay, it's easier to go backwards. If you're learning on state-of-the-art equipment, anything that you come in contact with in this industry, you're gonna be able to pick up like this. Now, you all listen to the radio, I'm assuming, right? You know when you hear a call on the air that it's not live, right? Because of what people can say. I mean, sometimes there's a four-second delay, a seven-second delay. I believe Imus, when he came back to CBS, has a 40-second delay. You know what? It works like that in this industry. Um, that they, it's, record, it's recorded into what's called a 360 shortcut. And this is Party Marty. You're going to meet him later. He's going to show you how we record into a 360 shortcut. And he's a great example because he's been in this industry for over 30 years. And in the old days, and I don't want to age him, but he's younger than me. Uh, in the old days, he used to have what's called reel-to-reel -reel machines, and you'll see them in some of our studios. And he used to have to play a song like Baby Stairway to Heaven, right? And then he'd record that call, and the tape would go flying all over the place, and he'd be lucky to get it back on the air in 14, se in 14 minutes, right? Nowadays, he might play a short commercial, record it into the 360, knock it out on the air, and it highlights his program. Everything today is digital. You're coming into this industry at a great time. I'm assuming that everyone that wants to get into this industry has some computer skills, right? Not the end of the world. There's people my age, and I'm 55 years old, that have come here. We were not raised on computers since we were three years old. You know what? We might have to work a little harder, but if you work hard, you can still get there. Now, Studio A also has... Uh, we use a program called Adobe Audition. Some of you, if you know anything about editing programs, it used to be called Cool Edit. We use that as an editing program. We use a program called Quick Picks Media Touch for your music program. We have a more sophisticated music program in there called RCS Selector, which is used in about 90% of the stations here in America and overseas. Uh, we, every studio has dual mini disc player, dual CD player, dual cassette player, state-of-the-art microphones. Has anybody ever been in a radio studio before? Sir? Yes. 
Where? Uh, 101.5 WPDH in Poughkeepsie, New York. Okay. Uh, industry experience or you were visiting a friend? Uh, very little in the industry experience. Kind of just like a tag along. Okay, that's great. Well, you know when you're in a radio studio, when you see those big clumper boards, those are radio systems boards. Either they're dial-up or pods, right? Those are used in all radio studios. We use what's called radio systems boards. Now, that's Studio A. Now, over here is Studio B, and this is where you're all going to get to do your radio reads today, right? And once again, we are not looking for perfection. We're looking for potential. And it's the Joe Benigno WFAN copy. Can anybody tell me Joe's story? Where's my sports breaks? None? <laughs> Sir, what's Joe's story? I have no idea what Joe's story, but I know who Joe Benigno is. We know who Joe Benigno is, right? Nighttime WFAN for the longest time. Good. So the, uh... Does anybody know that Joe Benigno graduated this school right here? Okay, I'll give you a little short history of Joe Benigno. Joe Benigno, if you listen to Mike and the Mad Dog on WFAN, who listens to the fan? Anybody? Okay, so if you listen to Mike and the Mad Dog in the early 80s, you know that callers, in any format, they form relationships with the call screeners, with the on-air personalities, and Joe was known as Joe from Upper Saddle River, right? And one thing, we, two things we knew about Joe. He had an incredible sports knowledge, a passion for sports, and he had the heaviest freaking New Jersey accent in the world, right? Well, what he did is he forged a relationship with Mike Francesa, and they said, look, you know what? And listen, at the time, Joe was selling meat, he was selling real estate, he was over 40 years old, he already had a couple of kids, but he was looking for a career move, and he wanted to do something that he was passionate about. And he got, came here, got a great education, he won a weekend on-air shift at WFAN. That led into overnights where he was with Schmoozy for about six years. Then he did overnights by himself. Then he did the middays with Sid. Sid, of course, lost his mind, and now he's with Evan. And he's on the highest rated sports show in the United States. And if you really look at it from a perspective, that can be anybody in this room. You know what? He came, he worked hard, and he attacked his passion. And that's where we're going to work with you. And if you are big fan listeners, if you listen to Mike Up, Mike Francesca, the Mike Francesca, excuse me, Mike, uh, the the producer is Ed Erickson, and Ed Erickson graduated our first class when we opened our Westbury campus in 2003. And Eddie at the time also was over 30, had a couple of kids, was working in a bank, worked in a bagel store. We got him an internship at the fan. He took every shift that they asked him. And within a year, if you know the history of WFAN, uh, Mark Malusis decided he didn't want to produce anymore. And Ed was next in line. And Ed is the producer for Mike Francesca. And four years ago, he was in school. You know what? So it could happen for everyone. And that's why I say, if you're sports fans or anything, keep an open mind. Learn everything. It's only going to benefit you when you go forward in this industry.